Welcome back, everybody. We have Ryan Burge on the show. Excited to have you back for the Burge Report, Ryan. Welcome. It'd be a little weird to not have Ryan Burge on the Burge Report, maybe. You know, we could. We could do it, but it would be a big disappointment because people would listen because they want to hear from you. And if you're on YouTube, thank you for watching. You can actually see us. Um, but I, we've got a great question that that I want to ask Ryan um, and that he's going to answer with the data. So if you don't know Ryan, graphsaboutreligion.com is the website. He is the guy that's always putting out the facts. And a lot of people will say a lot of things and sometimes they're true, sometimes they're not. But the good thing about Ryan is that he just backs up what he says with facts. He just puts it straight out there. And uh, that's why we like him. And I know that's why you like him too. So there are between 350,000, 400,000 churches in the United States. Kind of tough to count. The question for today's episode is, are there too many? Do we have too many churches in the United States? But dad, I know we've got a good sponsor of this show and it wouldn't be happening without them. So we certainly want to thank Tithely for allowing us to do this. And I will be muted a lot because if the listener's listening closely or the viewer is listening closely, they're hearing a dog bark in the background. That is my grand dog. And I, I don't know what else to do. I mean, I've got him behind closed doors. I've got him in shackles. Not really, not really. I'm going to hear from all kind of people. But You could I put him outside. No way. No <laughs> way. Not my dog. So you'll you'll hear the dog from time to time, but so, but so be it. Thank you, Tithely. You are doing an incredible work, incredible ministry. Think about this. 40,000 churches now use Tithely for online and text giving. That's a remarkable number of churches. They are all about team ministry, their hearts to see the local church empowered. Hey, if you have not tried Tithely and their wide array of resources, of course, you think of just the giving resource, but that is, that's incredible too. Do so right now. Go on and sign up and look at Tithely. You can see Tithely.com in the show notes, or you can just write it in yourself, Tithely.com. Get their free report called the 2023 State of Church Giving Report. Fascinating information. Ryan would love it because it's all database. It's all about the information coming into Tithely from these churches. So you get 40,000 churches providing input. You're going to get a lot of information that is pretty solid, Ryan. So that's what Tithely's doing. I would love that data, Tithely. Send it my way, please. I will write posts about it. Thank you. Oh, oh, I think I think I'll do that. You're, you're talking about the raw data, raw data. Yeah, give me this. Give me the spreadsheets, Tithely. Religion, religion dot com. Would love to read that stuff. I'm sure. Oh, I, I'll I'll write the CEO right oh. after this. Right after this uh, podcast. Look at Tom. I'll write the CEO. Mm hmm. I'll well, we will. Yes, I will. <laughs> <laughs> Me, it's like, I'll go to the support line and wait on hold for 15 minutes. Tom's like, I'm right to the top, boy. Watch out. <laughs> Sam, tell us a little bit more because uh, uh, we're going to hear from Ryan about the too many churches that you introduced. Yeah, let, let me, Ryan let, Ryan, let me ask you that question just boldly and up front. And we don't really talk a whole lot before we get into the show. So if you guys who are listening, uh, we have a very minor script, and then we just go. Uh, so, Ryan, are there too many churches in the United States? Uh, maybe. Depends on how – well, I mean, it's obviously like a good academic answer. is like kind of, but kind of not. Um, the answer is there are probably not too many churches in America. The problem is that they're in the wrong spot. There are some parts of America that are incredibly churched, actually probably too church, too many churches, not enough people. And then there's other parts of America – where the opposite is true, there are too many people and not enough churches. And so I think the question is, are there too many churches? I don't think the answer is yes. I think the answer is if we can, if I could strategically move them to where they needed to be to kind of equal out the distribution of people to church, I think we'd actually probably be under churched. I don't know. Like, what's what, what do you think the right ratio is between people and churches? Like, a thousand to one feels too big, a hundred to one feels too small. I mean, I don't know what we want what the ideal size of church is, I guess, is the question. Because if you answer that question for me, then I can tell you like how to make that happen. Yeah, well, and this is the data that you've done. There's about a ch there's about 113 churches per county and about one congregation for every thousand Americans. Mm -hmm. That so, seems a little too big, right? Like how many churches could reasonably accommodate a thousand people? The answer well, is not that not many. many. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think the average church could probably accommodate 200, maybe 300, maybe. 
Well, again, depending upon the number of worship services, number of days and venues, all that kind of stuff. But yeah, a typical church in the U.S. is going to have under 200. And I think that's, I think the number, like if you would say like what number would be ideal, I would say like 400 per one. You know, because I think you got to build, you're going to build, there's going to be people who never go, right? So you don't want to, but you know, I was, I was talking to a rabbi the other day and talking about synagogues. I said, build it for Passover. Like build the sanctuary so big that everyone who wants to come to synagogue for Passover, it fits all of them. They actually have movable walls in some of their synagogues to kind of make the sanctuary bigger to accommodate all those people. It's obviously very expensive to do all that stuff and really not practical for a lot of churches. I think realistically, we don't have too many churches. We, I mean, if we had a revival, right, like a third grade awakening kind of deal, would there be capacity for all those people? In the current situation, I think the answer is clearly no, especially in the faster growing areas of the country, like in places like the Sun Belt and the Southeast. I think you'd be okay in places like Arkansas, right, or Mississippi. You wouldn't be okay in something in a place like Nevada or California. So if you're saying one congregation for every 400 Americans, yeah, that there needs to be about 60% more churches. That's right. And I think actually the easier thing to do, Sam, this is what I kind of, the piece is hard because it's like, well, what's the answer? Well, pick up a lot of churches from Arkansas and move them to Nevada. Like that is honestly probably the best way to solve this problem because right now you've got a lot of buildings sitting in parts of the country that are not being used or not nearly being used to the full their full capacity you know like my i'll give you my example my church for instance our building was built in uh the 1950s it was 16,000 square feet on eight acres of ground on the north side that we moved we're actually we're classic mainline church on the downtown strip and then the people wanted to move out to the edge of town because they wanted more room to expand our building was originally supposed to be 25,000 square feet with a second story and then there was a split in the church and they cut the fundraising goal. Thank God they cut the fundraising goal because it would have sunk us 20 years ago. And at the, you know, we had to, so we had to get rid of our building somehow. And you would be, I don't know how many people are listening to this. I've actually tried to sell a church building before. I'm going to guess the answer is not that many, but I have. And we try to get it appraised. You want to hear a really fun phone call with an appraiser. It's like, so what are your comps, dude? Like, you know, like there's, there's no comps for church buildings for sale. So he looked in like, you know, usually they try to look in the neighborhood or maybe even the city. They were looking like in Southern Illinois, like the entire region to try to find comps. And, you know, the insurance company came back and said, well, your rebuild cost is 1.8 million. So if your building gets knocked down by a tornado, it's going to cost nearly $2 million to rebuild your building the way it is right now. And we won't even rebuild it the way it is right now. There's certain parts we would just not do. And the appraiser came back at 400,000. Saying and even then he said, "There's you know this is just a wild guess, honestly." And we ended up getting we we showed the building to twelve different organizations. We got one offer. The offer was one hundred and fifty thousand dollars cash. Um, wow, wow! That's basically an offer for the land. Yo, we could. You, so you're telling me the building's worth a dollar a foot, <laughs> or like ten dollars yes. a foot? You know what I mean? Like you're basically telling me that. And actually, so here's where the story gets really sideways. I got a call from a developer a guy in town who buys up, you know, like build subdivisions and stuff like that. He goes, Hey, I heard your church building for sale. Do you still want to sell it? I go, yeah. I go, wait a minute. I don't want to sell it to you just now because I want to see what other opportunities crop up because I know what you're going to do with it. You're going to tear the building down and put a subdivision because it's a really nice piece of property We're on the highway. It's really prime real estate in a lot of ways. And luckily we never got to that situation. What ended up happening was we, there was a Christian school, classical school in town that wanted to expand and needed a building. So we gave them our building. They allowed us to worship there during the weekends. They have school Tuesday through Friday, and we have the building Saturday, Sunday, Monday. We pay them 100 bucks a month. They handle all the upkeep, all the maintenance, all the utilities, all the insurance, all that stuff. So that's how we got rid of our building. But I'm telling you, there's going to be thousands of churches in that exact same situation over the next 10, 15, 20 years, and the number of buyers is going to be down and down and down because there's not going to be that many opportunities like there were for us. So, so, so Ryan, I got this story. I'm not supposed to talk that much because everybody wants to hear from you, not from me, but I've, I've got the story. Sam and I are expert witnesses in court cases that involve ch churches on a pretty regular basis. I'm involved in one right now. I'm not going to give the location, but uh, it is not in the deep South. Just put that that way. The city where the church is, the church is in a downtown area. The city took away all of their parking by eminent domain, hmm. took away all of their parking, 100% of their parking. Now they don't have anything to bring people into the church 
and they're trying to sell the building without any, a church building without any parking. Mm -hmm. Let me assure you that that's not working very well. That's a, that's a, that's a church building that is not worth much. Now, if you were to ask them and me how many churches there should be per square mile, we would answer it a little bit differently or per people Let's say, we Mm -hmm. would say it depends on if the church is healthy or not. Mm -hmm. And so I know that you cannot measure that like the way that you do your grasp about religion. I understand that, but yep. that that's what we would look at. Okay. We need more churches. We just need more churches like this one and not that one. Yeah. So to give you some numbers, by the way, in Arizona, or sorry, in Arkansas, it's the lowest ratio, which is 407 people per congregation. So that's, that's the most church state from, from that metric. The least churched is Nevada. There are 2,042 people for every church in the state of Nevada. In California, it's not a whole lot better. It's 1,665 people per congregation. And by that, that's not just church. That's synagogue, mosque, any house of worship. But still, you can see the differences. Like there's a five-fold difference between the bottom of the, of the spectrum and the top of the spectrum, 400 to 2,000. So that's when, I, when I'm saying, like, I think some parts of the country are under-churched. I think you make a really strong case that Nevada, like if I was going to go plant a church, Nevada would probably be a pretty good spot I would go to. I've, and the thing is, it's about migration patterns too, because where are people moving? There's this great book called From Bible Belt to Sun Belt. It's about how like evangelical Christianity went from the Bible Belt out west to Southern California, Arizona, places like that by Darren Dochuk. Like I think that we the church the churches didn't move with the people. You know, what I mean, the building stayed in that one spot, and the people that would be members of that church then moved to California, and there weren't enough churches being planted in California to make up for that slack, those extra people that were there. So, you know, that question, if you ask the average person, like, oh, my gosh, there's a church in every corner, but it's like, no, it's way more complicated than that. Churches, buildings don't go away when people go away. That's, That's something true. my my church has experienced in real time, man. Like we did, the building is still there. It's going to be there hopefully for, you know, a hundred more years, even though the people went from 300 when the building was, you know, coronated or inaugurated or consecrated in the 18, or 1950s to today when it's got 10. So that's the problem is you can't move buildings very easily. Some people wow. would want to coronate a building, by the yeah, way. Yeah, well. They've- <laughs> going to decommission our building apparently like that's all go good luck hey good god googling how to decommission a sanctuary by the way like you're not going to get a whole lot of um there's nothing in the book of common prayer about that um there's a lot of like you know baptisms and burials and everything else there's not a whole lot on that so um yeah wow and when we're talking congregations this number you know 350 400,000 churches we really are talking buildings now, these buildings contain people, of course, and Dad, I don't know if you know this, but the, the building is not the church. The church, are the, the church is the people. I haven't heard that, Sam. Let me, let me, I, I need to take notes. I never hear that from people when we talk about church buildings. Now, what did you say? The, the, the building is not the church. The church is the people. Oh, God, yes. that is so profound. It, it's, so prof- it, it's one of the most profound things I've ever heard in my life. Forgive all the sarcasm. Brian, that's a running right? joke, by the way. We're, we're bringing Brian into some inside jokes with, <laughs> we, get we, those, get those we get those comments all, right. all the time. I'll give you one right now. Yeah, well, it, Christianity is not a religion; it's a relationship. Oh, oh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can I just tell you, I despise that comment for a whole bunch of reasons. But one is it makes my job as a social scientist super hard. Because you're like, are you religious? No, I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's like, no, you're <laughs> religious. Like, it's like we've made religion into a swear word almost. And it's like, no, I need you to like I, I tweeted this week about like how young people don't know what the word Protestant means. They call themselves yeah. Christians, but they don't know they're Protestants. Only like 12 percent of 18 year olds know they're Protestant and 20 something like almost like 30 percent say they're Christians. So like they don't even know what the word and part of that is that language of it's not a religion, it's relationship. It's like trying to walk away from all like the institutions and religious history of our country. And that might sound cute. And put a, It's a great bumper sticker, but man, it, it, it unmoors us from our past, our religious past, our historic, you know, like everything that, that made us what we are. Like I tell, I was telling someone today, please tell your people you're Protestant. Like stand up and say, hey, Martin Luther was our guy. Like we don't exist because we left out Martin. And they're like, no, we don't do that. We talk about, you know, uh, I'm like, okay, fine, guys. But <laughs> you're killing well, Ryan, you bring up a, a good point, but you know why? You know why churches have started using that language? Because it's seeker sensitive, Sam. That's my only explanation. 
No, because of the migration of people from Catholicism into non-denominational churches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't want to offend a very large feeder system into their church. Actually, the data on that is pretty clear. The the Catholic to non-denom pipeline is strong. Oh, we we, we were talking about that in a previous webinar uh, that we did right before this. I don't know if you knew that we were doing a webinar. You may have gotten a few referrals. I don't want to brag about us giving you (laughs) referrals, but we talked about you in there. And we we, we, we even we even had a graph from graphs about religion in the webinar. As long as you kept my name on the bottom, Tom, you didn't clip me off there, did you? Not we don't ever do that, Ryan. I we, appreciate we, that, guys. By the no, way, no, your, your graphs do have a certain look to them. You're very good about making them look a certain way, so you can always tell when somebody's stealing your stuff. Hey, I'm a branding expert. I don't know if you guys knew this or not, but uh, I was told a long time ago, so they use the same font, same colors, same basic setup every time, and now people go, wait, is that is that one of your graphs? And now what's funny is other people in this space are using the same font that I use on my graphs, and I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing I've been doing this able font for five years now and now you come on in and so that's actually a pro like just to kind of go aside for a second like when someone wants me to write for their publication they want me to use their style and their font and things like that I'm like wait a minute like people want they want to know that I did it and how are they going to know unless I use my font so it's like this interesting interplay of like what makes you you right like what makes as an artist as a preacher like what what is your stamp like what makes you unique and how do people know you individually and I think it's Churches have to do that too, by the way. Like really good churches have great branding. You know, you know what that without like seeing some one of their copy pieces. You're like, oh, I know who wrote that. You just know by the language and the design, and the colors and everything else. I think there's something to be said for that. Name recognition, like likeness recognition, is really really important. Hey, by the way, one of our best clients, one of our clients that is just we love them. They're Southern Neal's Church in Las Vegas. So we they're right there in the most unchurched area. Uh, they came, they, they come out of an independent fundamental Baptist background, but they moved away from the far right background. They're still very conservative and they have good leadership and they are doing so well. That is a real time example. Is it Josh Tice? Tice? What's the right? Tice, Tice. rhymes with ice. Tice. And it's Nevada. That's very nice. It's Neva- Nevada. Nevada does not rhyme with ice. No, it Whatever. does not. For you Nevadans out there, I'm just going to just say, I, I know how to say the name of your state. And you also need more churches, FYI, yeah, those yeah, living in there. planners, go out there and don't say Nevada. Say Nevada. Nevada. <laughs> <laughs> go out to Pahrump, by the way. Pahrump, not Reno, not Vegas. Like, pick one of those smaller towns, or like, out in the middle of the desert, or they, or they shot Tremors at, which is a great film. Go out there and then make put your... I remember that. <laughs> I showed my son I'm that so film. I'm so glad you brought up that movie, Ryan, because that is literally one of my favorite movies of all. Oh time. my gosh! I saw I saw my 12 year old. He goes, "This is the stupidest movie ever." I go, "No, it's not." <laughs> Hang with me, guys. You're gonna love it. And by the end, you know what they said? That was a good movie, Dad. I'm glad we watched. It's a tight. It's like a tight hour and a half, man. It's just action the whole way, and there's graboids, and oh, it's just it's the best. Is Reba in that well, one? Yes, I she's in the so. rec room with the with the graboid that comes through the wall, and they shoot him with the elephant gun and all that stuff. I thought I remember Reba being in that one. Wow. She's in everything. And she, you know what's funny about Reba? She looks exactly the same today as she looked in that movie, which was shot in 1990. Woman yeah. is not age. It's unbelievable. Anyway. Well, there's reasons. All right. So we have our Reba friends from Nevada who are tuning in, learning about Southern Hills Church that is pastored by Josh Tice. There Tice. we go. So this Love that. has been the most meandering of episodes that I think we've ever had so um <laughs> but i will let me bring it back just for a second i will say this like i think the i think and and, and sam and i like i have a piece that's going to run church answers next month where i really like zero in on like if you're looking for the demographic factors that make a, a place more fertile for church planting and church growth there is a formula you can look at the data and i think the number one thing you want to look at is population growth like find a county that's blowing up in terms of like growth is 8, 10, 20%. And if you start a church there, you're going to have a lot easier time growing a church there because there's going to be so much churn in the people that are there, right? They don't have, they haven't built ties in that community. Like good luck going to Flint, Michigan and planning a church. Not saying you can't, but that's going to be hard because everyone there is either going to be in their church for decades or they're never going to go to church at all. You don't have that people looking for a church thing. So if you look at the look at the migration patterns of America, where are we moving? We're moving to the Southwest, places like Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, Southern California, a little less now. 
if you plant a church there, you're, you're, the, 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 the seeds that are being thrown are being thrown on much more fertile ground than, 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 than in, in like the Rust Belt. So you got to be smart about these decisions. And there's plenty of data now that helps you make these decisions. And I know if God calls you someplace, you should go there. But I hope God calls you to a place where it's easier to grow a church, plant a church, maintain a church. Because, listen, it's hard enough being a pastor in America in 2024 with all the headwinds that are facing American religion. Like, find some place with a little bit of tailwind, you know, where you've got maybe a, a better than 50-50 chance of making it. And there's there's plenty of places like that. There are. In fact, you know, you've done some of this research. The counties that grew the fastest over the last 10 years are the ones that are most likely to have the highest ratio of churches to people, meaning the biggest, the, the fastest growing counties are the ones with the biggest need. That's exactly. Often. That is, and I think that's the other part of it too, is like you, you don't realize like you, okay, so you need roads, you need bridges, you need infrastructure, you need sewage plants, you need all, you know what else you need? You need churches, right? Like that's a, that's another infrastructure thing. And by the way, a lot of places that are growing fast are growing fast with non-white residents. And what we know are non-white people are more likely to be religious than white people now. Mm. So places with pockets of Hispanics, African-Americans, Asian-Americans, like that's a, a really fertile place. Like if you ask me where would I want to go plant a church right now, Arizona would be high on my list. Uh, around Austin, Dallas, Houston would be high on my list because of all those factors we talked about. That's where people are going to. I think there's just a lot more. And in the South, I think there's just more openness to religion anyway, just because it's more of a cultural thing in the South. So the, the answer is there's not too many churches in America, especially in these places that we're talking about right now. So and we are, we are talking to Ryan Burge, the, the, the Ryan Burge. And this special edition is called the Burge Report. And we're ans attempting to answer the question, are there too many churches in the United States? And you go see Ryan at Grass About Religion. Just, I mean, man, Grass About Religion, Ryan Burge, it is blowing up. It is really good stuff. And I know I interrupted one or both of you, but I wanted to remind our listeners and viewers where we are. Who was talking? Well, I was just going to make, and we can conclude on this point because we're coming up on time, but um, a lot of builders are not including church campuses in their plans. So it's even more of a strategic move to go to a fast growing area that doesn't have churches, because guess what? If a church planter doesn't do it, the development firm that's you know creating the neighborhood isn't going to do it. It used to be developers would kind of include a spot for a church or two, knowing that the community would want that. Now that's not happening at all. So these fast growing areas and these counties that um, have this high ratio of, of, of um, people to churches, there's even a greater need because if, if the church doesn't go plant churches there, developers and builders aren't going to do it. Um, but I will conclude with this. I will say this. I realize that, you know, there's a church in every street corner. It's a bit of a derogatory phrase, meaning that there's a lot of churches there and a lot of them aren't doing anything. And I think there's some truth to that. But a church on every street corner is also a kingdom outpost for the gospel. It's also a way for churches to reach people. So even in these counties and these areas that have, quote unquote, too many churches, which I agree with you, there's some that are probably got too many buildings. There's still an opportunity for churches to do something in those communities because they have a spot on a street corner. So it's not all negative either. So we've uh, we've got this third episode of the Burge Report wrapped up. We certainly appreciate you tuning in. Pre appreciate Ryan Burge doing this. We're having a lot of fun with the data that he brings. And we don't think Tithely as well. Um, they are an incredible company that does so much good for churches. Uh, they provide churches around the world with software tools to help them and their ministries thrive. Make sure you get the state of church giving report that's linked in the show notes. Um, this free report is something that you should have. There's a lot of data in it. And Ryan would love to have the raw data, that's right. um, but you don't, you, you don't want that. You want Ryan to put together a graph about it. You don't, you don't want to have to do it yourself. So uh, go check out graphsaboutreligion.com as well. And for all of you tuning in, we've got another Birds Report coming up soon. So we'll see you then.